was bawling my eyes out. And uh, all I had managed to do was point at the Mm X-ray, and he just said, are you pregnant? You know, we're both 21, in that this is also our first child. We're we're wondering, what's it going to be like? I cannot imagine. (laughs) I can't imagine having a child at 21. I'm 30 and I'm horrified. I want to have children before I'm 40, just so we're not a million years old when, when, you know, they're going off to college. Any day now, Shelly McKean will give birth to her first child. Shelly is 21, the same age as her husband Charles. The two of them are excited, but they have some trepidation. Brett Finley will also have her first baby in a few days. Brett is 36. Her husband, Henry Reynolds, is 30. They too are excited, but they are keenly aware that a chapter in their lives is coming to a close. In this program, we'll discover how one couple came to have their first child early in life and another couple late. We'll learn about the timing and spacing of children throughout history. And we'll look down the road to see the effects of having your first child at 21 or 36. Three developmental clocks come into play in the major transitions of life. The biological clock, the social clock, and the psychological clock all have a say in when to have a baby. Charles McKean is an only child. At 21, he's about to become a parent nearly 30 years sooner than his own father did. Being a late child has meant that Charles has become an early adult. He was only 15 when his mother contracted cancer. When my mom uh, got cancer and was really sick for a few years, that brought me and my dad really close together and we supported each other. Then after my mom passed away, um, we really got close. Not long after his mother's death, Charles' father became ill with emphysema. And it seemed almost that our situations switched. I became responsible for him because he was getting older and almost, I don't want to say depended on me almost because he would be so afraid because he'd, be, he'd lose his breath and he would call out to me and it almost seemed like we'd switched places. Before he reached the age of 20, Charles had lost both his mother and his father. I don't know, I think it really matured me. A lot of people have come up to me and say, boy, you're really mature for your age. I'm like, I did what I had to. And when my father passed away, ever I had no other family. You know, um, I had some cousins, but they didn't, they seemed distant. And right after that time, that's when Shelley came into my life. Charles and Shelley were introduced one afternoon by mutual friends who were dating at the time. He really impressed me because he listened to what I had to say. And usually I have quite a bit to say. (laughs) Um, But he respected me. And that was one thing that really impressed me. I seem to disprove her belief that all guys are jerks. Shortly afterwards, Charles asked Shelley to go out with him. After dating for only two weeks, he decided that she was the person he wanted to spend the rest of his life with. So he proposed. And I wanted someone who was independent, who can stand, and, you know, I don't want to say stand on their own two feet, but really to stand on their own two feet, someone not to lead me, and someone not to follow me, but someone to walk with me. Not long after they were engaged, Shelley became sick with an intestinal virus. When her illness lingered for three months, Charles became concerned. They went to the hospital for tests and were shocked at what they found. I was bawling my eyes out, and uh, all I had managed to do was point at the Mm x-ray, and he just said, are you pregnant? And I just kind of went, "Ah," Uh and nodded my head a lot. Mm -hmm. And he was like, okay, it's going to be all right. Don't worry, everything's going to be fine. And I was just practically having a seizure on the table. Mm-hmm. And so, like I said, they took me up to OB and did an ultrasound and determined that everything looked okay. And determined that the baby was about three months? I'd say it took us about a week to really get used to the idea. I remember we found out on a Monday, and I had a Tuesday morning class. And I was walking by myself to my class, just going, oh, wow, I'm pregnant. You know, like the first week... I was 
just going over in my head, what does this mean? I mean, because I, you know, I've been through a lot, but never this. We were planning on getting married in two years. And all of a sudden now it's, whew, we got to get married, you know, soon. With the help of their family and friends, Charles and Shelley had a church wedding just one month later. This kind of support and enthusiasm has eased their adjustment and given them confidence to handle whatever may lie down the road. And that includes tomorrow. I'm just going to basically see what happens. I'm not the type of person that's going to just sit around and go and hang onto the couch and say, oh my gosh, maybe I'm in labor. If something happens, then I'll take care of it when it happens. I've always believed in whatever something, whatever life throws at me, because life, you know, thrown me a lot of curveballs. And I've always just, I've always believed in do the best you can. Mm -hmm. And I, that's exactly what I'm going to do. <laughs> It's not unusual to become a parent, as Charles will, at 21. But it's rare to become one, as his father did, at 50. Is 21 too young? Is 50 too old? It all depends on the settings of three developmental clocks. The first is the biological clock, which governs our physical development. The biological clock is the body's way of saying when. And it says that 21 is the beginning of prime time for having a child. But from the optimal fertile uh, point of view, I think the best time, timing, would be for a woman perhaps between 22 and 32, and in the case of a man between the same lower age, 22 and 40. Alice Rossi, professor of sociology. What we know about moving outside that range is that early births, meaning by that under 16 or 17, are associated with a good deal of low birth weight babies. And at the other end of the lifeline, uh, in terms of late births above the th age of 38, the um, late births are associated with, again, various kinds of physiological impairment, and predominant among them being very varieties of Down syndrome. You may be biologically ready to have a child and yet be off time in terms of a second clock, the social clock. This clock represents society's way of telling us when. Isn't it about time you thought about kids? That's the sound of the social clock. But unlike the biological clock, the social clock can be reset from one generation to the next. Take the age at which you're supposed to get married. Earlier in the century, the age at marriage was uh, quite varied, although on average a later age. Then, of course, as we know, in the post-World War II period, there was a drop in the age at marriage with women on average marrying at the age of 20 and men at 22. And then in the last 20 years, we've seen another turn in that cycle to older ages at marriage. The third clock involved in our development is the psychological clock. The psychological clock stands for a person's inner timetable, for their own individual way of saying when. Our bodies may be mature enough to bear children. Our parents and friends may think it's about time we did, but we may not be ready. Our psychological clock is saying, wait. For Charles and Shelley, falling in love was on time, both were psychologically ready for an intimate relationship. Our relationship seemed so right and so close, and we really did feel love for each other. And we had been through life, and you know, a lot of other people, I've always had a belief that they have to go out and play the field and find out what they want. Me and Shelley, it just, we came together and it seemed just, just so clicked. right. Two weeks after we had started going out, I proposed. The relationship was on time, but the pregnancy was not. At the very beginning, like I said, that first week or two, I felt just really kind of out of it. Like I was walking in the fourth dimension or something. So I can remember like that night coming home and telling my girlfriends, I am pregnant, and it was like, whoa. Shelley's pregnancy was on time biologically, 
but off time socially and psychologically. When the three clocks are out of sync like that, life seems to throw us curveballs and we have to adjust. Now, six months after seeing that x-ray, Shelley has adjusted. She feels ready to become a mother and even a little impatient for the birth of her child. And it's, it's kind of neat because every so often I can like see a hand punch out or a foot and I can feel where the head is and stuff like and that. And I'm like, yeah, you're a little person in there. Don't get out. The story of birth timing goes back several hundred thousand years to the dawn of the human species. The few humans that existed at that time were organized in small groups in which the men hunted animals and the women gathered plant foods. As recently as 10,000 years ago, everyone on Earth was a hunter-gatherer. In all probability, humans, um, most of human history was spent in this hunting-gathering mode. So it's very interesting to anthropologists because when we want to understand the circumstances under which we evolved, we want to know about hunting and gathering. Professor Jane Lancaster learns about our distant past by studying the few hunter-gatherers who still exist in places like Africa and Australia. These are people organized like we are in nuclear families, people on the move. But unlike modern women, hunter-gatherer women nurse their children day and night for three or four years. The continuous nursing tends to suppress ovulation and prevent pregnancy. And generally speaking, we find hunter-gatherers are very restrained in their production of children. They tend to have one child about every four or five years. Uh, a woman who is very successful rearing children probably won't produce more than five in a lifetime. And this is uh, very, very restrained fertility in a non-contracepting population. It's likely that over 95% of human history was spent in this pattern of childbearing. But about 10,000 years ago, the pattern started to change. Humans invented agriculture, growing their own food instead of foraging for it, domesticating animals instead of hunting them down. We stopped the constant walking and settled down in one place. We became villagers. Anthropologists call this new way of life sedentism. Sedentism means sitting still. Sedentism allows women to uh, be much less physically active in the sense of taking long-distance trips and, and gathering food. It also allows them to essentially leave a, um, a toddler in the care of, a, of an older child. And one of the things that we find with sedentism is a uh, more frequent production of children. Uh, you get a birth spacing that's about every two years. And the potential um, is that a woman can have 10, you know, 12, 14 pregnancies in a lifetime. As far as we can tell, hunter-gatherer women experienced menarche, that is, the beginning of menstrual cycling, at about 16. So did women in sedentary societies. The biological clock did not change in the transition from one way of life to another. But the biological clock does not determine the day or the hour of sexual maturity or any biological event. Rather, it sets time limits within which the event will happen. In the last century, the average age of menarche has dropped. Because of better nutrition and living conditions, we appear to have reached the lower limit set by the clock. In many ways, we've had a peculiar history which has, at one level, brought fertility and sexuality to probably the earliest known uh, point in the life cycle for all of human history. That is, we've got a mean age of 12 and a half for, for menarche, and, and that means that all the other things, uh, like sexual interest, etc., are maturing very, very early. At the same time, the social clock has moved in the opposite direction. It takes longer and longer to achieve the status of an adult. So we've created a, like a, a 10 year or more period in which um, an individual may have the reproductive capacity of, of an adult, but the social role of a child. And it creates for a, gr a great deal of, of conflict and, and difficulty um, to make adjustments that are, are meaningful. 
For hunting and gathering women, the biological and social clocks were in sync. By the time they had their first child, usually around 19, they had already assumed the role of an adult. Not so today. Today we see two entirely new patterns of childbearing, one favoring the biological clock, the other the social. One is reproduction very early in the life cycle, and I would say, in fact, it's before the age of 21. Then we have another group of women who are really postponing reproduction until 35 or later. So it, we're getting a, a very peculiar uh, curve for reproduction, essentially uh, emphasizing the two ends of a distribution. Whereas most of human history, uh, sort of the peak reproductive years was between uh, 20 and 30. So from the point of view of history, neither of those two patterns are very typical of our species. They're new. Today, contraception is a normal feature of life. But because the biological and social clocks are out of sync, couples find it very difficult to decide when to have a baby. They find that the burden today falls on the psychological clock. I just had a whole lot of fun in my 20s, I mean, <laughs> with my work, and, and I, since I was freelancing stage managing opera, I was traveling all over the country and meeting all kinds of fun people and doing really exciting things, and if I'd had a baby when I was 20, I wouldn't have done that, and maybe I would still be thinking to myself, oh, now I'm really tied down, I haven't done it all, and I don't mean to imply in any way that my life is over, you know, just because I'm settling down and having a kid, but at the same time, I've got a lot of experience under my belt, which makes me feel like I'm a lot more fun and have had a lot more fun. Brett Finley is 36 years old and expecting her first child. Her husband, Henry, is 30. I cannot imagine. <laughs> no, I can't imagine having a child at 21. It, it, I'm 30 and I'm horrified. And I don't know that age... Well, maybe I'm a late bloomer, or maybe I'm just slow in, in reaching a secure adulthood, but I just don't think that I was prepared to guide someone a child through life, or that I was even economically prepared to deal with that. Any of the parental responsibilities, I was not prepared. Brett and Henry were married two years ago. They had lived together for several years before that. From the beginning in our relationship, she had always said that there, when we first decided to get married, um, that we, we would have to consider, I would have to consider a child. I mean, it was always, there would have to be a child. And I said, I'm not telling you there won't be, but I'm not going to tell you when or I'm not quite ready. The main reason why I was so intent on having a child is because I am extremely close to my mother. And I know my mom gets a great deal of pleasure and fun out of the things I've done. And I want the same when I'm her age. Henry may never have been ready to become a father, but he noticed something in Brett. Every now and again, you realize you've hit a certain milestone and she was hitting that milestone. And she wasn't, uh, wasn't a weep, it was just a little bit of a teary eye. Oh, I'm, th I'm, you know, I'm coming to 35, it's the magic moment. Because it's, it's, I guess it's beaten into to a woman, I, I suppose, that 35 is it. Uh, and there I was, procrastinating. <laughs> and so, it wasn't, uh, you, you got teary eyed once or twice. Mm -hmm. Somewhere along the line, the decision to have a baby was made. Well, sort of. All of a sudden, she stopped taking the birth, birth control and... Uh, Not behind his back. No, 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 no. It just, it, we didn't sit down and look at each other and say, okay, now we're going to have a baby. Um, it just occurred. For Brett and Henry, this was the best way that the decision could have been made. And I have trouble deciding, you know, what I want to do, what I want to wear. Uh, the next day, I can't even imagine making the, the decision I've already made <laughs> to change my life. I can't even think that far down the line. But it's done. What does having a baby at 36 mean to Brett and Henry? Biologically, the pregnancy was late. The risks are greater at 36 than at 21. After 35, the risks go up and all that, which is why we know that she's an Alexandra instead of an Alexander, is because you have to do the, all the tests, or you should do all the tests after 35. So you have and you know the baby's <clears throat> fine? Yes. Socially, Brett's pregnancy was on time or perhaps a little late. 
but psychologically, it was right on the money. Oh, absolutely. It was, it was as right as it could be, I think. I, I felt very comfortable with it, and I think you did too. Yeah, I think if you'd had to tell me, yes, okay, we're going to do it now, you probably never would have, just f from being nervous about it. Right. You're not going to be too old to be a parent. No, I don't think so. I don't think I give it a second thought, really. We've gone through, in the past <laughs> eight and a half months, we've gone through stages of absolute panic and being really thrilled and really excited and... And it's stayed pretty consistently that way, although we have had several moments of, oh, my God, what are we doing? <laughs> you know, so it's been pretty mixed, but I'm real excited, and so is, so is Henry. Now that the birth of their baby is near, Brett and Henry are filled with joy and sadness. They know an exciting chapter is opening in their lives, but they also know that a familiar one is closing. Brett began to feel her first labor pains one evening, when they went out to dinner. And as we were sitting there having dinner, it occurred to us that it was probably the last time that we were going to eat dinner, just the two of us, and we both started weeping into our fajitas. <laughs> and the waitress comes over and says, is everything all right with the food? And we go, yeah, we just think she's in labor, and it's our last meal together. And the waitress's eyes got about 10 feet big. It was very funny. <laughs> Today, many couples like the Finley Reynolds are opting to have their children later in life. It's a new solution to the problems created by the increasing lack of synchrony between the biological and social clocks. Professor Rossi. Now, the, a major reason for the postponement of births has been among the better educated segments of the population where there is a desire to become established in work to complete advanced training, become established in a career. Um, and there are several things going for that late timed birth. There is greater economic security. One can assume that there's more maturity on the part of both the uh, mother-to-be and father-to-be, which may make for better early years of child-rearing. But even though the early years may be easier, the later years may be harder. The woman who thinks that child rearing will be easier if she's well established in her career has probably underestimated two things. One, that the stress of rearing adolescent children can be greater than the stress of rearing preschool children, and that her work responsibilities are going to peak in her 50s. In addition, a couple in their 50s may have elderly parents to care for. As they approach retirement, their child may be seeking expensive higher education. If their child also marries late, there may be few years to spend with a grandchild. And there may be another concern. Actually, it wasn't too much of a concern for us until our parents were just, what? <laughs> She's going to be an only child? Oh my God, you can't do that. Professor Rossi. Well, it's interesting that uh, one point one could make is that probably increasingly the last birth will also be the first birth because there's an increase in the one-child families. And it's becoming more common. But our parents were, were most insistent that that would, that would be an awful thing to do to the child, an awful thing. And we thought, oh, we can, we can devote so much attention to this child, we can pay for his college, or at least part <laughs> of it. Um, what, a, what a tight little unit we'd be. The only child has been characterized as spoiled, demanding, lonely, and socially inept. Shelley and Charles McKean grew up as only children and felt the stigma. Oh, how many brothers and sisters do you have? And I was like, what, is there something wrong with me because I don't? Or, or was I bad? You know, or, you know, what, what's the deal? What's so big about being an only child? But I have had people come up to me and say, oh, I'm sorry, you're only an only child, and that they'd feel sorry for you because you don't have anyone else there. And say, like, I'm fine. I don't mind, really. Professor Rossi. This is where a lot of the research has shown that these characteristics of the only child tend to be nothing more than stereotypes. 
and they're not true. That is to say, only children are not, don't tend to be more spoiled or egocentric or, or lonesome. If anything, I think the only thing we could say there's a slight tendency toward is that they're more adult-oriented. Chances are a first birth at 36 will also be a last birth. Saying when may also mean saying one. And yet, whether you're 21 or 36, it's hard to peer down the road and imagine the long-term consequences of having a child. Neither of the couples we've met in this program are pregnant today because of a full-blown decision, because they've made careful calculations about the future. In some ways, they are simply taking what life's given them. At a time when the biological and social clocks are out of sync, the timing of birth has become a matter for the psychological clock. Now it's our decision, or indecision. But none of us knows what the future holds, only what time it is right now. For Shelley and Charles, and Brett and Henry, now is the time to have a baby. Right now, Shelley is two centimeters dilated in what they consider 50% of face. I have a class tomorrow morning, and as far as I know, I'm going unless I'm in, you know, so much pain that I can't get out of bed or something. I'm looking forward to delivering the child to, not delivering as in terms of labor, but carrying the child to her, actually being the one to give the child to her. While Puccini swells in the background. Right. <laughs> 